Hi everyone, welcome to Academic Access. Uh, this week we have the theme of physics and theology. And I'm very, very lucky, very fortunate to have um, a wonderful uh, individual who's Professor Mark Harris. Uh, I really look up to Professor Mark Harris because of the way he has personally shaped me as an individual, particularly in my development in the field of science and religion. Professor Harris, thank you very much for joining us on Academic Access. It's a great pleasure, Shoeb. I'm really delighted to come and join this this program because I'm, although I've done quite a few interviews down the years, I've never done one online like this. So it's a first for me, and I'm really interested to see how it turns out. And great to see that you've already made a made a start on this kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I think people are eager. So I, I'm guessing a lot of people are going to sign up. So we've had a lot of interest when we uh, put up the poster. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so what I usually do, Professor Harris, before uh, we get into you know yourself and, and the topic of which we have for today, I just explain to people how we kind of met. So Professor Harris um, is an instructor. Um, uh, and I think you're now a full professor, yeah? You just you got yeah. the title last year, yes. And he actually developed the Masters of Philosophy, Science, and Religion program at Edinburgh University. University. Um, and uh, I was very keen in this program. So I waited out until the year was uh, until it was developed online. And it was through the online program where I got to uh, speak to Professor Harris, particularly in the science and scripture module that you uh, teach. And uh, since then, Professor has, has been incredibly helpful in terms of getting my own thoughts structured, the kind of options that I have in front of me. And he's been very, very supportive overall. So um, personally speaking, I think Professor Harris has been an excellent mentor for me. And I hope that many other individuals who take up the program as well. I know that uh, you've had other students um, who, uh, who, who have met uh, Dr. Ahmed Galal, for instance. He was, I think, one of your students as well, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, people often ask what about the religious profile of the students who come through our programs. I think we've had about probably about 150 students by now. And I think we've had pretty much every single world religion and none um, represented on the program that there is. Although it has to be said that the majority come from Christianity and Islam. Oh, wow. OK. All right. OK. Mm. I, I didn't know that it was, uh, uh, it was both Christian and Islam. OK, that's good to know. Right. OK. So and do you think that this, this program is gaining more prominence? Because it's only been, I think it was launched for two years now. It's the third year that's starting this coming fall. The online program is certainly yeah, gaining yeah. prominence. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, the online program was developed off the back of a campus-based program we've had going since 2012, which is just called the uh, MSc in Science and Religion. That has a smaller cohort, so we usually operate with about 10 students a year there, whereas the online one, we might have um, 60 or more at the moment. Um, but we've been doing really well lately with in terms of the kind of accolades for particularly for the campus based program. I think the online one is still still too new. So with the campus based one, um, we've been kind of cleaning up all the prizes that, get, uh, that are offered for student essays and research prizes, for instance, in the, sci the academic science and religion world. So we've become a very well known academic program, one of the probably major um, training grounds for people in the science and religion, science and theology world uh, in the world. So, you know, we're doing very well and uh, I'm very pleased with how it's been going so far. Great, great. Uh, so I think, Professor Harris, before we now get on to the topic at hand, I think people would love to know about you as an individual. So, you know, what is your what, what has your journey been like? Where did you start off? Did you always want to do science and religion or did this come about by luck? We would love to know more about that. Yeah, uh, quite a story. How long have you got? Um, so <laughs> I, I, I never planned any of this. It's entirely by accident. Uh, I think some people can, you know, have a have a certain kind of iron determination that they will set out to be as such and such, a, like an astronaut or something, and achieve that. But with me, it was never the case that I thought I would uh, spend my life researching and teaching in science and religion. So I remember as a teenager, I that very early on uh, decided that I really wanted to move into science and wanted to be a scientist. And for me back then, um, the thing that really interested me was geology actually and earth science. So I went to university, studied geology, but actually as I moved through up through that and did a PhD in mineralogy, you know, a particular branch of geology, um, it was the kind of fund fundamental questions about matter and physical matter that really were um, exciting me. And so after my PhD, I moved, was able to move into physics simply because of the kind of research I was doing. There was a lot of crossover. So I went to Oxford, did a postdoc in physics, um, still enjoyed it enormously. And then 
managed fantastically um, to get a permanent job at the Rutherford Appleton Lab, which is one of the main um, research uh, institutions in the UK, which is centrally funded. So it's not owned by any one university. It exists as a sort of facility for large scale experimental facilities for, for universities in the UK and, and across the world. So I was there for quite some time and um, made uh, some of the well, some some one, one particular discovery that I'm probably if I can say I'm proud of anything in my academic career it would have been the discovery of spin ice which I can I can go on at great length to you about but it's not really relevant to science and religion but it does as a as a kind of discovery it, it started off a, a field of in fit or branch in in condensed matter physics which is really flourishing now so it's, it's lovely to see I get sort of thousands of citations for my papers back then anyway um after I'd been there about six or seven years, my wife, who um, is a philosopher of religion, was starting to think seriously about getting ordained as a priest in the Church of England. And the kinds of questions she was asking herself about, you know, the fundamental meaning of, of life in the world, the sort of things that religious people ask, were really starting to chime with me. And I, I was starting to get a little bit frustrated with physics in a way, because I'm mean, fascinating as it is. I wasn't able to ask the questions about what does it all mean? What's underneath all of this? You know, you only go so far, you know, the, the, the deep level equations in quantum physics, for instance, but what does it mean underneath? So um, the questions she was asking herself as she was preparing to think about ordination started really chiming with me and I started exploring the track myself. So I took a degree in theology um, at Oxford, absolutely loved it, which was Quite a surprise to me because I have to confess that as a, well, by then I was calling myself a physicist, although I didn't have a degree in the subject, um, as, a, as, a, as a kind of, you know, a newborn physicist as it was, um, I had a rather arrogant attitude towards theology as an academic subject. I think I assumed that firstly, as a, um, a kind of easy level humanity subject, it probably wasn't very demanding compared to physics. And secondly, that because I'd been a Christian for quite, quite a few years by now, I probably knew most of what I needed to know. But I, I went, I took, took the degree because I thought, well, it'd be useful to, to have some background in it. And I was absolutely blown away by it. Um, not only was it as rigorous and as academic, uh, uh, intellectually challenging as physics, I found it absolutely turned my world upside down in terms of how I started to see the kind of priorities in, in my academic life. So anyway, to, I'm, this, I realize this is getting into quite a long story. No, I so, think people um, are enjoying it. Definitely yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe. So I'll carry on anyway. So I, I went through and got ordained in the church, started working in a parish, became a chaplain in Oxford University, and started teaching theology. And of course, the physics wasn't going away either. I was still doing some experiments and work there. So before long, people started asking me to give talks about this, you know, what's this, what, what is it about science and religion? Can they get along? Can they ex coexist? Or are they destined to fight it out to the death? And so I started giving talks on this, started thinking seriously and started teaching the subject. And um, before I knew it, I was being asked to apply for this brand new job in Edinburgh, which set up the master's program, which I now run. Um, and, you know, I started discovering really all about this area of science and religion, which um, in the popular level often exists in these kind of debates you see between Richard Dawkins, for instance, and, and some religious spokesperson, but also has a very serious and very active um, academic arm or wing as well, um, much of which is reflected in things like the um, MSc in Science of Religion we teach or the online program or, or other programs across the world. So it's a, it's a kind of flourishing academic discipline in itself, although in terms of its kind of popular or public perception. It's largely seen as, as um, these two, two big things crushing against each other and trying to uh, fight it out. So that's just as a very um, a rather long-winded explanation of where I come from. Started off in geology, went through physics to theology, and I somehow settled in this academic area where I teach the crossover between them. But like I said, I never intended to do this. It just seemed to work out that way at every right. turn. Right. So um, I think one question that I have for you is when you were going through the, you know, the theology, did you um, have any conflicts that you were handling at the time? And if so, how did you deal with them? Because many people nowadays, they have this, you know, significant worry. Oh, the science and religion, this seems to be a very, you know, um, worrisome discussion. 
That's a great question. And I've been asked it many, many times, although not quite in that way, Sherb. So I think you've you've kind of hit on a, a different angle. So when I was working full time as a scientist and people would often learn quite quickly that I was also a Christian, very active in the, my local church. They would often ask me, you know, how can you be a Christian and a scientist? Surely there's a conflict there. And I would say, and I probably had some kind of carefully rehearsed answer, went, went on the lines of, no, there's no conflict whatsoever. Um, and, you know, this would often leave a certain amount of puzzlement on the, 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 the questioner's face. And I, it's clearly, that, that I think because, at least in the Western world, however you want to define the Western world, there is an assumption that science and religion have to conflict with each other. It's inevitable. And over the years, I've come to realize that that's what sociologists often describe as a social construct. Namely, it's an assumption that is kind of deeply built into the into the kind of ideology of the times. It's part of the kind of assumption of secularism that mm -hmm. um, religious belief can exist as, a, as an option, if you like, rather than a kind of a foundational um, uh, position in the society. And once you start to de detach religious beliefs from the kind of sense of truth, truth, um, then you start to ask, well, what is, you know, what is truth and what are the, the ideology you want to live by? Other forms of thought start to come in. And of course, science is very dominant in our world. And before you know it, you start getting the kind of conflict narrative where science and religion have to be in conflict with each other. It's just kind of an assumption. And I suppose quite a lot of my activity in the science and religion world is trying to debunk that idea of conflict and trying to get underneath it. But but I, I'm kind of getting off the subject, really, because you asked me um, about conflict in my own uh, sort of journey through science and then theology. What I did discover, a great deal of conflict, actually, was when I got into theology and, and discovered um, uh, biblical criticism. So, you know, critical study of the biblical texts, Christian scripture, in other words, the idea that, um, you know, there might be different ways of reading these scriptures. And in particular, the subject we often refer to as hermeneutics, you know, theories of reading, um, and the idea that you might be able to uh, determine whether one verse is more authentic historically than another. Or you might go so far as asking questions like, um, you know, how much of this text was written by Moses, for instance? How much of it was probably interpolated by some later editor to try to make sense of the traditions? And so on and so on and so on. And you end up with, of course, way down the line with very critical questions like, did Moses exist? Did Jesus exist? Did Jesus say any of all these things? Um, so, you know, of course, biblical scholarship has become infamous for this kind of scepticism. But it's risen out of this, um, I suppose, uh, the modernist idea that we should um, critique and ask kind of intelligent questions. Where does this tradition come from? And what, what's the authority that it relies on? Anyway, when I discovered this, um, it really did blow my mind completely. And I think for a, for a good year or so, I just didn't know whether I was coming or going in religious terms, because much of what I thought I believed about my own religious traditions as a Christian came from knowledge of the Bible and, and the, the, the belief that the characters in it and the stories in it were largely as they said they were. Um, and the, 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 the realization that actually there's a whole branch of scholarship devoted to trying to sort of critique these um, assumptions was, like I said, absolutely mind blowing. Uh, I found it very, very off putting, but also fascinating at the same time, which is why I ended up um, becoming very interested in biblical scholarship and the whole idea of scriptural hermeneutics and trying to assimilate it in my own kind of way as a scientist. And this is where the, the course, which I know that you um, were on showing of science and scripture, trying to understand how um, the natural sciences have altered or influenced our own understanding of um, of these scriptures. So, so that really was where I think conflict between science and theology, or rather modernism and theology might be more accurate. That's where it's had a, a really deep impact on me. Hmm. Right, okay, wow. I think many people could resonate with that. Uh, particularly, I think, you know, in my own research, I think that the whole debate about evolution and Quran and Hadith are, are of great interest right now and uh, yeah so people are questioning all all kinds of things about this but it's great that we have a platform where we can hopefully learn more about these ideas and be able to develop the field um Absolutely. so
So Professor, um, you wrote or you edited this book, uh, Philosophy, Science, Religion for Everyone. So, and, and the chapter that you wrote in here is what we're going to be discussing. But before we begin uh, on that particular topic, can you explain what is the nature of this book and how it's related to the online master's program? Sure, yeah. So when um, I wrote this, or I edited, or put it together, shall I say, together with my good colleague, Duncan Pritchard, who's also a professor at Edinburgh. He's a philosopher and epistemologist, to be precise. Um, we put together the online masters in philosophy, science, and religion. And it was uh, kind of preceded by a MOOC in, with the same title. And we wanted to put together a textbook, which was fair, hopefully fairly affordable. I mean, it's something like, um, I, I, it's probably about $15 or something like that on Amazon, 10 pounds on Amazon. Um, that was fairly affordable and also pretty direct in the way that it, you know, got at key questions that people were asking, but introduced subtleties very early on, you know, tried to get at what actually is going on here. So uh, my own chapter has a very naive, um, title, which I never would have chosen myself, but Duncan and I set out to say, you know, we are going to ask these really direct question that pe questions that people are asking. Um, I think my question is something like, faith and physics, can they be reconciled? Yeah. Of, course, of course they can. Um, that would make for a very short chapter, though. So I, 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 I wrote, a, it was quite testing to try to tease out my own, own sense of nuance and subtleties there. Anyway, so we asked quite a number of people in and around science, theology and philosophy in Edinburgh and beyond to contribute chapters to these kind of rather naive questions. And the, the result is that textbook, uh, which we've used in the MOOC and also in the, the Masters in Philosophy, Science and Religion. It's been quite, quite a useful sort of starting point for many people, I think. So you mentioned MOOC. I don't think many people will know what MOOC is. Can you expand uh, what you mean by that term? Sure. It's uh, M-O-O-C, Massive Online Open Course. The idea is um, it's a free course. You don't have to pay any money to, to get on it. Um, uh, they are hosted by some kind of platform, where, which usually... Um, Coursera? Uh, it's Coursera is our particular MOOC. Yeah, that's right. So if you go look at Coursera.org, uh, on in a web browser, you'll be able to find your way to our, more, our MOOC and sign up to it. And you'll find that there's a, a program of lectures given by various uh, fairly big names in philosophy, theology, and the sciences actually about these questions, uh, which are integrated with the, the kind of viewpoints or, or the kind of scheme of the book. And the whole point is that, and this is true of most MOOCs, uh, or many MOOCs anyway, um, our particular MOOC anyway, is, is it's true of this, um, it's a shop window for a much more um, thorough the much more thorough grounding you would you would get if you were to enroll on our kind of full full blown masters in philosophy, science, and religion. So the MOOC is a kind of starting, a free starting point, if you like, which anyone could enroll on. Right, right. Okay, okay. I think people, and, and if we wanted to find out more about this, um, uh, I've posted your academia page and also your, your university link. So if you guys want to find out more information, feel free to click on those in the description box. Um, Professor Mark, we have a question by Walid. What would you, so I'm guessing this is, this is a question related to your, uh, uh, the, the modernism and the impact it's making on theology. So the question is, what would you say if someone could, if, so, if someone said that this type of ideology came after Hume, religious people were seen as dumb people and religious were seen as the intelligent? Do you think, you know, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, great question. Um, I think many of us, or many people in the modern world, more or less just assume that uh, I mean, of course, your question uh, assumed a certain amount of philosophical knowledge, first of all. Of course, you've got David Hume in there, one of the key um, figures of the Enlightenment. But whether people are aware of Hume's role and Kant and others, uh, other Enlightenment philosophers, they generally tend to live by this kind of modernist philosophy where, you know, you, you think for yourself, you ask, ask questions, um, you have your own opinion on received truth to the extent that you may not have received truths anymore. Well, it's interesting that in spite of the kind of spirit of modernism and the spirit of enlightenment, where you question and critique all received truth, yet um, the natural sciences in particular have become the kind of uh, icons of truth in our modern world. So they, they seem to be rising above this kind of spirit of criticism to the extent that 
Um, you might talk about scientific knowledge as being ob objective truth. I sometimes hear this. And I, I'm often rather astonished by the attitudes that people take towards science here. I think, well, you know, do you not understand how science is done? Um, the whole point about the natural sciences is that, of course, scientific knowledge is, is always provisional and always it's always changing. Um, there, there isn't a single scientific idea that hasn't mutated uh, over the years in some way or other, and except the sort of broadest ones of all, for instance, like, you know, there is matter or something like that, maybe. Um, the whole point about science is, is that, you know, knowledge is very sketchy, it's very provisional. So, um, but, but for some reason, because of uh, the secular ideologies that tend to be dominant at the moment, in, in particularly in the Western world, however you define that, um, science gets away with it. But it's also worth thinking, of course, taking the long view here, um, science is a very recent phenomenon in human thought. We're talking about sort of three, four hundred years. Um, human thought goes back way, way before this, of course. Um, religion and philosophy go back, as far as we know, thousands of years, perhaps much further than that still. So science is a very recent phenomenon, and I think we're still learning how to, how to live with it, really. Um, I think it's very much the kind of upstart at the moment, the mm -hmm. kind of enfant terrible, you might say in French. We have to learn how to how to use it well and how to understand it and how to what it tells us well, what it can't tell us really. Um, I don't know if that's uh, answered your question, but I think it. Uh, the, 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 so uh, let me go back to this one. Religious people seem as dumb. Uh, yeah, I think it's true that as a set, as a rather sad result of the kind of dominance of the natural sciences as being kind of truth seeking disciplines it means that if you have um, a strong commitment to religious belief or philosophical uh, ways of seeing things you're probably seen as being less intelligent implicitly um, sadly um, and wrongly i think uh, because you know the sciences have become almost religion like in the way they are um, appraised by many people in our modern world. And this is what's often referred to as scientism, of course. Um, right, okay, right. I think that was a, that was a good response, uh, Professor Harris. So I think that's actually a great entering point for the topic of today, which is physics and theism. So um, when I was posting around your poster, one of the um, like skeptical and almost, I would say, uh, negative sense that I was getting from one person at least was well, what does theology have to do with physics and somebody responded um it teaches you how to count angels on a pin so you know that age old question <laughs> how many angels can you count on a pin so uh, professor harris why is the intersection or the interface of theology and uh, physics so important yeah, again, this is a great question and one that I can't answer in any simple, quick way, I'm afraid. On the one hand, I would, I might be as bold to say that physics grew out of theology. So the natural sciences in some sense were, uh, if, you, if you look back at the history of science, particularly to the early modern period, so pre-enlightenment, these are people like Galileo, Copernicus and so on. Um, many of the very early discoveries in this early modern phase were just explained, justified in theological terms because they were quite simply um, pretty striking to people at the time and needed theological justification in order to, 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 to be understood. Um, and there is an argument to be said that um, at least in that early modern phase that uh, the sciences and particularly sciences like physics, which are very mathematical in their outlook, actually borrow a lot from theological ways of thinking. And you can see this particularly um, going to the theological uh, kind of framework that most of physics works with. Uh, one of Galileo's most uh, important contributions to the history of the world is to point out that um, uh, God is a mathematician, basically. And he was saying this in order to justify his um, discovery, his belief that mathematics was actually foundational to how we should understand nature. I mean, of course, mathematics has been around for thousands of years, but it wasn't really until Galileo that that, that con close connection between the um, simple algebra, algebra we might use, for instance, in New Newton, Newtonian mechanics, um, and 
what is really happening in the world. It, was, it wasn't really until Galileo that the people started making that close connection. And he felt that he needed to provide a theological justification for it in order to really make the point strike home. Now, of course, that uh, connection between maths and reality, thanks to the success of physics ever since Galileo, um, it's become so, uh, you know, everyone just takes it for granted now to the extent that it's completely forgotten that Galileo had to make that point. Um, and, you know, it's even got to, so far as the, the point where you say, well, how, you know, what, what is, what's the connection between physics and theology? Surely physics is so successful now, particularly with its mathematical background, as to put all religious belief, um, you know, out of the window. We don't need to believe in religion. Uh, if we can see the success of physics. But I suppose the point of what I'm trying to say here is that in terms of the history of physics, uh, these kinds of theological arguments were very, very important in justifying the developments at the time. And Newton is probably an even better example of someone who, uh, uh, so the Newtonian framework of time and space, and I mentioned, I explained this in my chapter, the way that Newton justified his use of time and space, which has become pretty much uh, what we would almost describe as common sense in our world, um, he explicitly used theological justification to, to, to explain the physics he was doing. Again, um, it's become so common sense to us that it just seems well, of course, it's obvious. It has to be that way. But, you know, it, it was really a, a, a kind of a, a collaboration between science and theology that made that point. So certainly in the history of science, you can see that um, there was a huge amount of positive uh, growth of the sciences out of theology or with theological thinking. Is it clear that the same happens now? Probably not. I think um, actually the situation is quite quite good at the moment. I think that, that we are asking these questions. That the sciences have grown, have have, have um, moved so far from theology that we have to ask, you know, what's the relationship? Because um, it's allowed the sciences to, you know, to develop in completely new ways to ask the kinds of questions that they may never have possibly asked um, if everyone had been a theologian. So to give you an example of a modern debate, for instance, uh, the multiverse hypothesis. This is the idea that um, our universe is just one of many. Mm -hmm. um, there are various different versions of the multiverse hypothesis and they, they're used in various different ways in physics. But um, they, many of these hypotheses challenge a lot of theological beliefs. So it's difficult to see how if you had a kind of strong theological context you were going to develop that kind of the kind of physics that uses multiverse uh, um, hypotheses so um i think that the fact that things have been cut between physics and theology has allowed for a lot of positive um kind of creative thinking in, in the sciences and you could certainly say this I mean, the most obvious example i suppose is to go outside of physics to go to biology and to say um, well, look at what's happened uh, with the creation evolution debate. If um, if the biological sciences were still heavily kind of wedded to a creationist viewpoint, then um, what would be the state of the biological sciences now? Probably very, very different, I would imagine. So um, I, 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 I myself think that this, this separation between the sciences and theology is probably probably healthy for, for everyone's everyone's sake. Right. Okay. That's a very controversial stance. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. I think there's a slight delay here. Okay. Um, uh, so the, the, the question, so, so to follow up from that, uh, Professor Harris, so physics, at least today, is um, as, as you know, it's very modular. So we have a certain kind of physics that governs the atomic level, we have certain kind of physics that governs the macroscopic level and then Einsteinian physics in terms of large scale stuff. And all of these have very different implications, right? Now, uh, given these different metaphysical implications of these different models, um, how, how strongly can we take physics to inspire our theological insights? Mm, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. So um, again, I think I'll have to unpack that slightly as I answer it. You, you're absolutely right that uh, 
like most of the natural sciences, physics has, has splintered into lots of sub-disciplines. Mm -hmm. And although I count myself a physicist, I don't know a great deal about particle physics, for instance, or cosmology or, um, or atmospheric physics. But I think I know a, I have a good working knowledge of my own area, which is condensed matter physics, which is physics of condensed matter. In other words, um, solids and liquids. So it's it's all it's all of the physics between the particles, the tiny things, and the the, the cosmos. Um, I think I, I have a reasonably good grasp of what's going on in that area. Um, so one one phenomenon we have to take into account is the the massive splintering of the sciences, massive growth of the sciences, such that no one person can understand the whole. I mean, back perhaps in the 18th century, it was probably true that you could say that some of these great people of science were, were polymaths, you know, they, they, could, they could say something intelligent in many different fields, simply isn't true anymore. I'm a complete layman when it comes to chemistry, for instance, yeah. or, or, the, or the biological sciences. Um, although I do have an understanding of, you know, what you might refer to as the scientific method. Um, but I'm afraid I've lost lost the thread of what I got so excited about this whole, the whole edifice of the sciences. I've slightly lost the thread of what your question was about theology. Can you just re remind me? Sure. So the splintering nature of physics that we have these modular frameworks and uh, they all have different metaphysical imp implications. So Newtonian mechanics has a certain consequence of how the world is structured you know, in comparison to quantum mechanics. And given these very diverse theories, how are we suppo supposed to, you know, take all of these different ideas into account and develop a rich insight of our own theology? That's That was the question. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, thanks, yeah, sure, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, um, one way of looking at this is to say, uh, uh, I suppose I was developing the kind of splintering of the sciences. When you're working inside the sciences, you're very, very aware of this, the fact that the sciences are, in disciplinary terms, extremely diverse to the extent that, you know, you may not understand very clearly what another scientist sitting next to you may be, may be doing. Um, how do you make sense of that theologically? Well, on the one hand, we could apply um, theological thinking about the kind of the wonder and the diversity of creation that, that God and, and, you know, certainly I, I'll, I'll speak. I know you've asked me to talk about faith and theism. It's very difficult to talk about theism in general, but I'll, I'll have, to, have to do it from our own different traditions. So of course, of from course. the kind of Judeo-Christian tradition at any rate. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a huge wealth of scriptural um, resources that would talk about the wonder of creation, all pointing to God as the creator of this. Um, and also fantastic scriptures in the Psalms, for instance, about how creation joins in, in praising the creator back, you know, the, the, the valleys and the hills and the trees shouting with praise, for instance, these metaphors of praise. So there's this kind of rich um, theological context for talking about creation and worship. And I think when I tend to look at the diversity of the sciences, particularly the kind of splintering of knowledge, the um, on the one hand, I can get a little bit sort of pessimistic and think, how on earth are we ever going to make sense of nature out of all this kind of complexity and diversity and, and lack of understanding of what each other's talking about? On the other hand, as a theologian and as a, and as a religious believer, I can see this in a theological, much wider theological context of praise and um, honouring of God's creation. So I have that, it helps me, I think, to understand the sciences as an, as an edifice, seeing them growing out of this theological phase, I suppose, in medieval times, early modern times, but still reflecting something of the kind of wonder of creation. Mm. Does, that, does that help answer your question? So um, yeah. from that point of view, I think much of the science and theology dialogue is largely about what you might call creation theology, where mm. the scientists are telling us much more about creation than we than we knew 500 years ago, say. Right. Um, in, in addition to that, um, so I think in the past 50 years, uh, there's been the development of a new kind of way of thinking. So if you go back, you know, from the 16th century, we had this idea of natural theology. But in the past 50 years, uh, the new, new strand of thinking is theology of nature. So theology inspired by science, what would that look like? 
So, uh, and, and that for me is, at least as somebody who's trying to approach the discussion, is a very difficult discussion because as you said, physics has become so complicated. Like even now defining matter is such a complex question. How do you define matter? Is it a wave? Is it a string? Is it you know an atom? And on top of that, you have these different frameworks on different scales that becomes kind of hard to address what exactly are we talking about? Which physics are we referring to when we want to have a theologically inspired uh, nature of things? So um, now you mentioned the multiverse. So uh, I now, would you see? Would you say that it would be a, a fair point to say that the multiverse theory would be one of the few, or at least one major challenge to theology? Or do you think that that can still be absorbed in a theological framework? Yeah, so many people uh, who are aware of this question um, find, at least religious believers anyway, find the multiverse hypothesis quite a challenge. The reason being that since about the 1950s, 1960s or so, uh, quite a number of little details have been noticed in the physical sciences particularly uh, and growing in biological sciences too about things that just seem to be just right in the sciences to, to explain how carbon-based life, life on this planet, uh, intelligent life and humans came about. So in other words, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is uh, and thinking about the fundamental physical constants, for instance, the speed of light, charge on the electron, things like that. If it turned out that they were just minutely different, then not only would we not have um, life on the planet Earth, we probably wouldn't even have a planet either, or maybe not even atoms. In other words, the, 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 to turn it on its head, it's almost as though uh, these constants, and there are many other aspects of the physical sciences which, which would look would point to their own areas and say this. It's almost as though um, someone wanted to make intelligent life, or life anyway, planets and life, and tune things just so it was just right. And this is called the fine tuning idea. And of course, it implies that there is a being, some kind of intelligent being, who finely tuned all the constants and, and set things up just right so that um, life would evolve and humans would appear. This also goes by a, a whole, um, uh, there's a whole sequence of arguments collected under the title of the anthropic principle here. Um, now, quite a number of religious believers, particularly those who, are, um, who adhere to a form of thought called intelligent design, uh, take this as a very important principle, the idea that you know, science is telling us that there must be a fine tuner, you know, some kind of intelligent designer who actually thought about all of this and set it up just right. But um, an alternative way of looking at things is to say, well, well, there are there are various ways of looking at it, but the, the main contender to that to the fine tuning is to say that, well, this is just one universe of many. We just happen to be in the one where things turned out just right, but there are many others where which are completely different. And as far as modern cosmologists are concerned, uh, they tend to work just on a on a day to day basis with with the assumption that goes with multiverse hypotheses. You know that, that this is one kind of universe, but it's contingent in the sense you know it didn't have to be this way. There are potentially others. So, uh, and particularly if you're a string theorist, there might be ten to the power of five hundred um, other universes out there. So, yeah. um, this is actually becoming a fairly mainstream idea in uh, in cosmology and physics. But like I said, that some religious believers find this deeply, deeply challenging. Um, and it's become quite a kind of philosophical conundrum, uh, which students often encounter in philosophy of religion and certainly in science and religion courses. About, you know, what do we do with this stuff? We hear, on one hand, we've got this scientific evidence that suggests that, you know, that all of the conditions were just right to produce intelligent life um, but on the other hand you know we've got um, scientific ideas like biological evolution which suggests that everything is chance uh, everything is determined by chance um, can it really be true that science is t telling us there must be a fine tuner so um, and the, the, the philosophical approaches to this uh, tend to take various forms um, 
And again, you you, you get you tend to find people falling into sort of one of several ca camps, depending on whether their kind of gut instinct is to to want to believe that, that you know that natural theology, in other words, theology of theology of the natural world, is telling us about God, or whether there is something more subtle going on here. I tend to be one of the latter kind, so I, I'm not really a, a firm believer in fine tuning. I I think that probably it will turn out to be, we'll understand it a different way eventually. Um, what do I think about multiverse hypotheses though? Well, insofar as it's a scientific idea, and I suppose one criticism that's often raised towards the, the multiverse hypothesis is you simply can't test it. Um, at least we don't know how to test it at the moment. It's it's a kind of conjecture, specula non-scientific speculation from that point of view. On the other hand, it does allow, the, the multiverse hypothesis does allow some good physics to be done. So I'm quite happy to go along with it at the moment. And if you ask, well, does that mean that you don't believe in God then? I say, well, of course it doesn't mean that. I'm just as happy to believe in a God who made 10 to the 500 universes as a God who made this one universe. So it doesn't um, affect my kind of theistic belief at all. So um, you can see, I hope, that the issues are actually really rather complex here. Yeah. Although, like I said, some believers do find it threatening, the whole debate around fine tuning. Yeah. So, um, Professor Harris, so that's very interesting. You say you're not too convinced about the fine tuning. May I ask why? Uh, uh, well, convinced about it. Well, I, I think, okay, so uh, insofar as fine tuning is a fairly well established scientific fact, you know, there, there are, there's a whole collection of uh, parameters in physics, chemistry, biochemistry, and so on that appear to be finely tuned. I'm quite happy to accept that. And I, I've got a few friends who are cosmologists who also quite happily talk about fine tuning. But when they talk about that, they don't mean and yes, I believe in a fine tuner, they mean more that there is um, a deeper philosophical issue behind the science, that um, our position as observers is such that um, we seem to, you know, our, our very existence as observers means we are observing things about the universe that require us to be here. How do we interpret that? In other words, the science is, is raising questions for physics and theology, but not necessarily um, determining questions or determining the answers for physics and theology. Um, and right. I just noticed there's some questions arising actually, which I yeah. I, did, I don't know if you want to. Um, yes, yeah. I okay, have so, uh, David's question. Jamie Turner. So he's asking, do you think there are some obvious differences between how Muslim Christians may differ in their approach towards dealing with some of the issues in science or religion? So you gave us some examples like metaphor, uh, metaphorical hermeneutics or adoption of methodological natural. Oh, that's actually, that's a good one. And that's, I think, relevant to us. So do you think, um, so there's a whole debate, as you know, um, about philosophical naturalism versus methodological naturalism. Um, how do you think that maybe uh, we would differ at least given our different traditions, uh, do you think that we reach the same conclusion? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, this is a really interesting question, which, um, so Christianity, uh, or science and Christianity is becoming quite a well-established area within theological uh, scholarship now. Um, sadly though, um, other world religions are only just starting to get in on the act and as far as I can see Islam is the next one that's starting to get really interested in the questions that arise. Yeah. I'm doing it, 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 yeah, yeah, and it's a really exciting area and I, I really hope that a lot of um, Islamic thinkers that move into this area because it, it, it's fantastic the way that um, uh, Islamic thought brings very different uh, um, perspectives and emphases and one, one of the main differences that I see is uh, I suppose the scriptural traditions are of course different and yeah. the way that scriptures are read hermeneutically are very different as well and that raises different kinds of questions for the whole science theology enterprise as well. So Christians tend to assume that we kind of, um, we talk about science and religion as though uh, we are the kind of representatives of religion but it's largely because we, I think we uh, ruled the roost for so long um, but it would be great to see some Islamic uh, thoughts come along here and challenge what Christian science and religion scholars have done because like I said there, there are many huge differences it's, for instance in, in scriptural thought. Um, 
methodological naturalism. Now, this is this is a great question. I'm only kind of rather vaguely aware of. Uh, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of aware that this is one of your interests, isn't it, Shoei? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I and I it, it is an in, an interest in Christian thought in the science and religion world, largely in so far as the intelligent design movement has really challenged it. Mm -hmm. um, methodological naturalism as the basis of science. For myself, as someone who has had you know, uh, you know many years of working in the natural sciences, and I still do a little bit when, when I can, um, I'm very happy to accept the kind of assumptions that are built into methodological naturalism, um, largely because and I can justify themselves theologically to myself now because I can see how it developed in the history of science back when mm -hmm. um, the scientists were theologians and vice versa. Yeah. So I don't really see it as a, yeah, sure. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I think it might be a good idea just to kind of distinguish what is philosophical naturalism versus methodological naturalism. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So um, when you say philosophical naturalism, I'm assuming that this is what I would call metaphysical naturalism, yeah, yeah. which is um, ge generally the belief that um, uh, there is nothing beyond or out with, I'd say in Scotland, the, the natural world. So we might talk about the supernatural and the natural, well, there is no supernatural. Um, and the, the success of the sciences in explaining the natural world would be kind of uh, accumulative evidence that metaphysical naturalism is 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 correct. So that would be that the, you know you're making metaphysical claims from observing the natural world. Um, methodological naturalism, on the other hand, is common to all of the natural sciences, and actually it's common to pretty much all um, academic thought by and large, except for except for theology. You know, you, you don't tend to work in, um, oh, I don't know, history, for instance, and assume that you're going to receive a divine revelation as to how um, you know, writing some history of the 15th century, for instance. So it's actually fairly common across the board, but it, particularly it's associated with the natural sciences, of course. And this is the assumption that um, we will always be able to find a naturalistic explanation for any given phenomenon that we're interested in. So um, even if we're completely stumped about something, there might be a real problem about explaining, um, I don't know, some, um, some missing link in an evolutionary chain, for instance. Maybe a, a previous generation might say, well, this is where God worked. But a methodological naturalist would, would say, no, you know, can't hang on a minute, let's, let's, try and think, let's do some research, let's work and, and kind of do our science until we, we might be able to find an answer here. So that's, I tend to see methodological naturalism as a kind of a stubbornness, uh, not to give up thinking scientifically, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and from that point of view, I mean, it's it's explained in various different ways. That's, that's how I see it, as this kind of yeah. scientific stubbornness, if you like, um, to keep trying to keep working on the problem until you can find a naturalistic way of explaining it. Um, and like I said, I, having seen the way it developed in the history of science, I'm perfectly happy to adhere to it. And uh, since I can see that it, it is helpful, I, I believe that it's helpful that the sciences and theology have some kind of um, split or some kind of clear blue water between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then in, in that context, then how would you interpret miracles? Yeah, well, as you probably know, miracles is one of my my big research areas, yeah. simply because uh, this is one of the main areas where all of my thoughts about methodological naturalism all fall down, because you stop <laughs> being able to make these nice distinctions yeah. where you kind of put physics on one side of the room and theology on the other. It's just you just can't do that, um, and it's fascinating simply because, and again, it's one of those topics that appears in usually in kind of philosophy of religion 101 classes so it's introduced very early on and keeps being reintroduced as you go higher and higher up the kind of class in in philosophy simply because it's just so difficult even to define the term of what do we mean by a miracle mm -hmm. so in the modern world um so again it, it the, and i'm thinking in terms of the modern world which is 
heavily influenced by secularism. Um, we tend to use David Hume's definition. And actually, it's, it's, um, it's becoming clear that he wasn't the first to have this definition either. It's just he, he's the one who we, we kind of associate it with. Um, his definition is that a miracle is a transgression of a law of nature by the deity or an invisible agent. So some you know, a su a supernatural cause, in other words. And we tend to just assume that that is what a miracle is. Of course, it has the effect of um, introducing a really heavy form of dualism into our cosmology. So you have a natural world defined by the laws of nature, and then you have the supernatural. And there's some kind of um, you know, heavy or very, very rigid boundary between the two, such that the only way that you could get from one to the other would be my means of a miracle. So, so the your creator God who set the laws of nature up has to literally break them. I mean, there's a, there's a degree of kind of inconsistency here in the way the metaphor works, but but that's the way it works. So in the modern world, we tend to assume this kind of really um, heavy dualism in our cosmology, which hasn't always been the case in the history of thought in, in various cultures which have um, acknowledged miracles. So th that, that's our definition at the moment, but... Uh, you can in, you can quite quickly see problems with it if you are a believer in miracles or if you are open to belief in miraculous traditions um, and certainly it's the case that in the history of ideas people haven't always had that way of thinking in fact it's probably only really been around for a few hundred years really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, uh, so two questions, Professor. I'm going to choose one from the comments, but I have two questions for you. So, um, as a physicist, you know, I mean, you've you've written several papers. You're an established physicist yourself. If you say, if you proclaim that, you know, you believe in miracles, how would your, you know, your colleagues react to that? Would be the first thing. And number two, um, I've been thinking much about um, this idea, but um, I think that um, there were some things that were classed as miracles in the past. But given what we know today, perhaps we can kind of uh, redo them in light of what we know of, of physics. Um, so, for example, this idea of, of, of this is just me thinking out loud here, right? So the idea of Moses's stick when it was when it converted to that snake. I mean, I'm thinking of nanobots, you know, that can easily convert from one form to another. But but what what do you think about that? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. So. Uh, one of my, uh, my kind of ho academic hobbies, if you like, is collecting explanations for miracles, naturalistic explanations for miracles. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating. The, uh, some very serious uh, articles have been written in the science journals explaining miracles in the Bible. Um, one of the favorite locations to look is, is the Exodus. And of course, you mentioned Moses and his staff. Um, things like the crossing of the Red Sea are very, very popular. And there are quite a few different naturalistic explanations of that, which instantly raises all kinds of questions like, well, you know, OK, so uh, so maybe we can explain the way that Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. But so, so I guess, what, what, is that a miracle then? Well, I suppose the miracle would then be in the timing. Moses and the Israelites were just there at the right in the right place at the right time when the sea just happened to part because of an earthquake or a tsunami or something like that. So you, you move the location of the miracle around, or in other words, the cause of the miracle. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily deny it altogether. So uh, science has certainly affected the way that people um, approach miracles. One of the things that science hasn't done, though, is it, it has never um, done away with them or has never done away with belief in miracles. So um, Newton and his friends, one of their kind of early, uh, they, they were very productive in this, in looking at the miracles in the Bible and finding naturalistic explanations for them. And at the time, this wasn't because they wanted to explain them away. Uh, and, and just remove all belief in God in them. It was because they actually wanted to say, well, look, the Bible is, we, we can explain what the Bible is doing using science, which means the Bible is actually true. This really did happen. So um, these kinds of scientific explanations can, they, they're sort of a double-edged sword, if you like, or rather they, they have a two sides to them. You know, you might be able to um, explain away a miracle, but for 
other people, that might be a way of supporting the miracle, supporting the tradition. So when we say we're a believer in miracles, I think it's a it's often you probably have to go beyond that and say, well, what do you mean by a believer in miracles? Do you um, do you believe all miracle stories completely unquestioningly or do you have a particular way of believing in them? And what do you mean by miracles? So, um, I think uh, nearly all miracle traditions that we have in across the various world religions, this, this interesting kind of side feature about miracles, is they've nearly always raised skepticism. Um, you know, even back in the, uh, the, time, the biblical times, for instance, you can find discussions of skepticism about miracles. And I think one of, one of the features of this kind of kind of event or kind of tradition that's being told here, story that's being told, is that it challenges our sense of what is normal, what is right, and what the um, our deity might be doing. And I personally think that if if miracles are not challenging, they're probably we're probably not appreciating the tradition um, sufficiently. And that might be. A, I could get myself into deep water if I go further. But yeah. So so you've got a question. Haven't you? Yeah. So on that point, I think Walid has asked a, a relevant question. Uh, Professor, how do you view the approach? How do you view the approach of scientific miracles in scriptures, or superimposing science of scriptures? So this is that boundary of hermeneutics then now physics or, or science in general. How 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 do you uh, how do you operate that? Yeah. Thanks, Willie. That's a great question. Uh, various ways of looking at that. So scientific miracles in scripture. So. Um, Whenever we read scripture, we bring our own presuppositions and our own context to, to the words we're reading. And for many of us, that means translating what we're reading into the, the worldview that we know now that makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. So it, it's almost inevitable that you're going to bring some scientific ideas into that. And one of the, the best known examples of this at least in the Bible anyway, is if you go to the first chapter of Genesis with the story of creation, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth, and, you know, and God said, let there be light. Um, many, many, many Christians and Jews this, these days would read that, and perhaps Muslims as well, would read that and instantly think of the Big Bang, that this is kind of a, a, almost like a, maybe not a prophecy, but certainly it's reminding them of this, of our own creation story, if you mm. like, from science. So we certainly bring that kind of um, context, our scientific context to mind. Now, a much more interesting or a very interesting question that arises is, did the original authors have that in mind when they wrote that, wrote that text? Now, if you were thinking as an historian, you'd say, no, of course not. How could the writer of Genesis have known anything about the Big Bang? You could say, well, that writer had some kind of divine revelation okay that's always possible if you believe in divine revelation another way of looking at it is to say that we're um, superimposing our own kind of modern readings onto the scripture because of course it's possible that in future centuries the big bang model becomes discredited and we have a different model of um, the formation of the universe and what would, what do we do about reading the scripture then? So um, all, all I'm suggesting here is that um, kind of because science is a slowly moving, um, slightly slowly moving background, really, it's probably not a very reliable fixed yardstick to interpret scripture by. But it does. We can't escape it, really. I mean, you simply can't read stories of creation without thinking about your own ideas of the universe and so on, I think. Um, and so, so we tend to superimpose science on scripture. It's, it's inescapable, really. Um, but personally, or this, this, this is one of the conversations we often have in the Science and Scripture course, where we try to get into this. Um, what, what is the kind of mindset that we're adopting here? Can we try and adopt different mindsets? And this raises the question of hermeneutics, which is what are the assumptions that you're bringing to the text? And how are they informed by your own understandings of theology and your understandings of the theology of the, the people who wrote the text originally? Um, how can we try to go deeper here? So I think this is a great question because it opens up a whole um, conversation about, um, about the theology of scripture. What do we believe scripture is and how do we believe we should read it in theological terms, quite apart from 
scientific questions of Big Bang and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Professor Harris, I know you have to leave, but I'm just going to ask you this last question from James here. Um, so, essentially, what James is asking is that you know, in in modern physics, we have so much mathematics, and of course, theologians when they when they want to get into science and religion, it becomes very intimidating. So can we still discuss about science and theology if theologians are not informed about it? So that, I, I want you to kind of take that as a, as a, to a start of a broader conclusive point. And what would you advise young thinkers who want to get into this field? How do you approach science or religion? Yeah, that, that's another great question, James. Thank you. I, I always um, say that, uh, uh, okay, so, back in the 19th century, it was suggested uh, that no one should get into the whole science and theology conversation unless they spent at least 15 years in a branch of science, learning about it and getting a PhD and all these kinds of things. I personally think that's a little bit of an over-exaggeration. Nevertheless, um, I've certainly gained a lot from my time spent in physics and, and trying to really grapple with a, with a science. So, I think young um, people who are kind of aspiring to understand what's going on between science and theology, uh, I would suggest going beyond just um, uh, just kind of engaging in a kind of popular level with science and trying to really grapple with what's going on before you ever even start thinking theologically. Um, good science, I think, nearly always leads to good theology. And so to answer that specific question that you asked James about um, advanced maths. Uh, it's probably not necessary for most people to kind of grasp what's going on in physics, uh, but also understanding the maths as well. But certainly if you do get into the maths, you will understand it much more deeply. And I, th and I believe that the kind of your theology will follow on from that. So it won't be effort that's um, wasted. Uh, so my my own my own advice is usually you know don't don't skimp on the science I suppose you know, do try and really grapple with it as insofar as you are able with your with your own amount of time you've got to spend spend towards it. All right, guys, there you have it, uh, Professor Mark. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. I really appreciate this. I'm sure that many of our viewers would appreciate it as well. Um, guys, if you want to get in touch with Professor Harris, uh, his descriptions are in the details, so feel free to contact him. He has his email address on the university website. Uh, Professor Harris, I'm sure you, I mean, you're, you know, you'll be willing to respond to some of the inquiries that may come out of this video. Um, thank you. I hope to see you for the next discussion. Take it easy, guys. Have a good day.